Welcome, church, to our Sunday early morning edition huddle, right? So glad you're here. A couple things I just want you to be aware of. Uh, this afternoon at 4.30, uh, Angel and I will be leading our next session of Home Builders. Uh, it's really targeted for parents of younger children. And uh, right here at 4.30, if you have some young children, we'd love to have you uh, take part in Home Builders. Uh, tonight at 6 o'clock, right here in the auditorium, we are going to be hosting... Um, the Zoe ministry, a um, couple ladies who have started this ministry are going to come and do a presentation to help us be aware of human trafficking in Delaware. And I would love to encourage your presence and, and we're going to be able to learn and find out how we as a church maybe can help support uh, their ministry and that's uh, this evening. And I just want to express some appreciation and thanksgiving for Adam Woods who preached the last two weeks in our Salt and Light series. Uh, wasn't that good? Yeah. Thank you, Adam. Sweet. Uh, and let me give you a heads up. Uh, you know, I'm really so thankful uh, for all of the attempts of reaching wider I see in a lot of your lives. Uh, your encouragement of people, your affirmation of other people, your, your love for people, wanting to reach them for Christ. And I'm just, uh, way to go. Way to go, church. Another opportunity we have in the near future, in a month from now, is uh, Easter weekend. I just want to give you a heads up about Easter. Uh, because of the crowd and the influx, and we want to provide as much room as possible, we're going to have four services on Easter weekend. The first one's going to be Saturday night at 5 o'clock. Saturday night at 5. And then our three regularly scheduled Sunday morning services. And I want to encourage some of you to kind of sacrifice your own agenda to make room for more people and to either choose the Saturday night service or the third service on Sunday morning. You know, go ahead and just sleep in on Easter Sunday and, you know, come to that 1130. That would provide more room for most of the people who would be our guests. We expect 400, 500 guests uh, that weekend, and that just makes room for them. And so I just want to give you a heads up about that and another attempt of reaching wider. Typically in November, I like to steal away, get away for a day, and I like, to, I like to map out the next year's preaching schedule. This past November, I, I you know, stole away for the day, and uh, my, my attempt was to map out the whole preaching schedule for 2020. And I tell you, I left that planning session in success. Everything mapped out. I had 12 clever sermon series that just promised to be awesome. And then I listened to a sermon by David Platt, recommended to me by Linda Brahms of our church. And there was a quote in that sermon that made me trash the whole plan. Thank you, Linda. David Platt read a quote in that sermon from Martin Luther, and I want you to hear it, and I want you to see it. it. Changed my life. If I profess with the loudest voice and the clearest exposition of every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking. I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady on all the battlefields besides is merely flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. If he flinches at that point where the world and the devil are attacking, it's a disgrace. I don't want to be a flincher. Oh, it's easier to flinch and run. But I don't want to be that guy. 
because we're at war. First Peter chapter 2, 11 and 12 says, says this. Don't skip ahead of me. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from the sinful desires that wage war against your soul. We're at war. And in our culture, there is a war for my soul. There's a war for your soul. There's a war for our children's soul. And we can't flinch. We have to fight. I want to give you a heads up that today I want to share a message with you that's kind of a standalone sermon, doesn't fit in the series. And from time to time this year, Adam or I are going to be preaching messages that we know really attack where the, you know, helps us fight where the devil's attacking or where the world is attacking right now. And at the end of the year, we'll be able to put all these sermons into a series that we're going to call Frontline. Frontline. Because we want to run to the front line to help you fight. Because we're at war. Today, I want to share a word of grace and truth with you with regard to a message called sexuality in our culture. Sexuality in our culture. We live in a culture that teaches and preaches and keeps encouraging us to to believe that freedom and fulfillment is in expressing and following our desires. In fact, our world keeps preaching that we are to idolize sexuality. In fact, our world keeps telling us you can even choose your gender. Legislatures uh, across the country have already started to vote to replace biological sex with sex assigned at birth. Which basically means This world is teaching your children right now and will be teaching your children that sexual identity has nothing to do with biological makeup. It has everything to do with how you feel. And you can choose your gender based upon how you feel. We have to fight. Today, my goal is to give you a big picture view of what the Bible says about sexuality. And I think we ought to start at the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Listen to this. Um, It's so powerful. Verse 26 says, Then God said, Let us... Us... Obviously, the father is having a conversation with the son and, and the Holy Spirit. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So God created in his own image, mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. Oh, may the Lord bless the preaching of his word in this place today. Amen? I'm a little nervous. <laughs> the map of today's message is simply this. I want to share with you ten truths from the Word of God with regard to our sexuality. And if you're here for the first time today, I am so glad you are here, especially today. 
Not only are you going to get a big picture view of what the Bible says about sexuality, you are going to hear how God so loves you. Welcome to the crossing. Ten truths. Truth number one. Every one of our bodies is wonderfully designed by God. Every one of our bodies is wonderfully designed by God. Psalm 139 says we are fearfully and wonderfully made by God himself. Amen? We live in a culture that keeps telling our babies that aren't even born yet and the children who are born that they are not wonderfully created by God. And that's a lie. Every one of our bodies is wonderfully created by God himself. That's truth number one. And that's so foundational to this topic of sexuality. You are wonderfully made by God. Truth number two, and so foundational to this topic of sexuality... Truth number two, look at this. Every one of our bodies is ultimately created for God. This is huge to understand. The Bible keeps telling us that you and I were created by God and for God. Revelation 4.11 says you and I were created for His pleasure. We were created for Him. That's foundational to our topic of sexuality. So foundational. And I want you to know that every other discussion in our culture around sexuality is not based upon that foundation. Every other conversation of sexuality in our culture is based upon the foundation of self. And our culture keeps pointing you to, you need to be true to yourself. You need to live your truth. You need to fulfill your desires. It's the only way for you to be happy. Church, you and I have to be at least better at asking this question, what if though that foundation is a lie? What if the foundation for that question is actually not true? What if... What if you really aren't the center of the universe? What if everything in this world doesn't really revolve around you? What if everything revolves around God? What if He is the center of the universe and everything revolves around Him? How about this question? What if, what if your body was not created for self-satisfaction, but God glorification? That changes everything, right? It changes everything. And so to build on that foundation, we're not asking, how can I be true to myself? We're asking, how, do I, how can I be true to God? I'm not driven by who I am and what I feel. I'm driven by who he is and what he said. Does that make sense? So foundational. You and I were wonderfully made by God and we were actually created for him. Look at truth number three. Truth number three is every one of our bodies is supernaturally designed to be satisfied and fulfilled in Him. That's how God designed us. We're actually going to find fulfillment and satisfaction in Him. Now, our culture preaches something different. Our culture actually preaches that satisfaction and fulfillment and freedom come from sexual identity. sexual expression. Real fulfillment is found in sexual identity. But 
what if that's not true? What if our greatest need in life is not sexual liberation, but what if our greatest need in life and the only way to be fulfilled and satisfied is in the Lord? Because we were created supernaturally to find satisfaction and fulfillment only in Him. Look at truth number four. Truth number four is this. Every one of our bodies is sexually defined by God for our own good and His glory. Every one of us have been sexually defined by God for our own good and for His glory. Glory. Now, the world keeps causing us to question that. The world keeps getting us to question the Word of God and to wonder whether our design really is good or not. And I want you to hear again, you are not a mistake. You are not born in the wrong body. You are wonderfully made by God and your sex was determined by Him for your good and for His glory. Now, I want to be sensitive to some in the audience. I know many in this world who think different from that and who feel different from that. And you may be asking, but what about these thoughts that I have? What about these desires that I, I, I've had ever since I was born? What about... Well, that sets up truth number five. Please don't miss truth number five. Tr truth number five is every one of us is prone. Every one of us is prone to sexual confusion, deviation, and rebellion against God. Every one of us. Confusion... And rebellion is the natural result of sin in our world. Romans 3.23 says all of us, every one of us, sin, falling short of the glory of God. All of us. Genesis chapter 3, from the very beginning, uh, Adam and Eve, they started to question and doubt God's plan for them. And then they finally decided to do what they wanted to do. Well, guess what? Every one of us are prone doing the same thing. Every one of us are, you know, are prone to question and doubt the Word of God. And every one of us has gotten caught up in cho choosing our own thing rather than what God says. We've put our own feelings and choices over what God has told us to do, haven't we? We're all prone to this. We're all prone to confusion and deviation and rebellion uh, against God. We're prone to it. Does it help when our culture comes along and says, you've got to be true to yourself. If you have a certain desire, the only way to be happy is to fulfill the desire. I mean, you have a right to fulfill your own desires, right? Even if those desires are, are, are yours from birth. You were born with it. Can we just state the obvious? Every one of us have desires within us that we know we ought never to fulfill. Every one of us have already chosen not to fulfill some of the desires we have. I, ho I hope I'm right. Time Magazine had an article one time that was entitled Infidelity is in our genes. Infidelity is in our genes. In other words, if a man has a sexual desire for a woman who is not his wife, the only way really that he's going to be happy and fulfilled is to fulfill those desires. And my wife says, you better not. Just because you have a desire doesn't justify or excuse the behavior to fulfill it. Am I right? 
but we're all prone to being confused, to deviating, and to rebelling against the plan of God. Every one of us. Which sets up truth number six. Every one of us is guilty of sexual sin. Every one of us is guilty of sexual sin. All have sinned and fallen short. We could be talking about unfaithfulness, promiscuity, pornography, fantasizing, lustful thoughts. Do I need to go on? We're all guilty. Which sets up truth number seven. Our greatest need in this life is reconciliation with God. Every one of us, our greatest need, we are so desperately in need of reconciliation with God. Now, our culture keeps preaching your greatest need is sexual liberation. Your greatest need to be happy and fulfilled is to fulfill your sexual desires regardless what they are. But our greatest need in life I mean, if there is a God who created us, if there is a God who wonderfully designed us, if there is a God who loves us and redeems, redeemed us, our greatest need is not to keep rebelling against Him. Our greatest need is to be reconciled to Him. Make sense? Reconciliation. And please don't miss this next truth. It's the best one on the whole list. Look at this. Jesus has made a way for every one of us to be reconciled. Jesus, he emptied himself from heaven. He went to a cross to pay your price for your sin. He went to a cross to take your place and pay the punishment for your sexual sin. He was buried and then was resurrected to life. The Apostle Paul preaches in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, what I receive from the Lord, I want to pass on to you as first importance. Jesus Christ died for our sin, according to the Scriptures, and he was buried, and he rose from the grave, according to the Scriptures. Jesus made a way to be reconciled to God. Jesus is a way maker. He's a way maker. He provided a way for us to be reconciled to Almighty God. He went to a cross in our place to cover our sin. Hallelujah, right? Truth number nine, every one of us can enjoy ultimate identity in God, through Jesus. Every one of us. Our identity in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says you are a new creation. If you're in Christ, you are a brand new creation. Romans chapter 6 teaches us that when we're baptized into Christ, we, you know, we die with Christ, we're buried with Christ, we're resurrected to live a brand new life with a brand new identity. Hallelujah. Now, our culture loves to preach and encourage that your identity is all wrapped up in your sexual desires. And we can use all the labels. L-G-B-T-Q-I-A-R. There's like 50 other. And you just need to identify with your desires. Your desires are what makes you who you are. But the gospel opens us, awakens us to a whole new grid. The gospel says Jesus died for you. That he came for you. He sacrificed himself for you. In fact, he went to a cross to, you know, yeah, we were sinners. 
We're all guilty. We're all guilty of sexual sin. Yeah, we rebelled, but God sent Jesus anyway so that you and I can have a new identity in him. No longer slaves to sin, but children of the king. No longer in bondage, but free. No longer uh, stained by sin, but cleansed from sin. No longer living with God as judge, but loved by God as father. No longer deserving eternal separation from God, but now enjoying intimate reconciliation with Him for all eternity. Amen? Thank you, Jesus. New identity. One more truth, and let's land this baby. Every one of us have a choice. Every one of us have the choice. God gave us the choice. And here it comes down to this. You can reject and defy God in your life, or you could repent and depend on Him as your life. comes down to that. He gave us a choice. Now, I'm right now looking at a bunch of males and females with un unique lives, unique situations, unique questions, unique struggles. But I want to ask you the same question. What will your choice be for your life? Will you choose to defy or depend on the Lord? I mean, where are you going to put your faith? Think about it. Where are you going to put your faith? In the ever-evolving thoughts of our culture or the everlasting truths of God's Word? And what do you really want to trust do you really want to trust your own self-centered desires or do you want to trust in the everlasting love of our God? You have a choice. You're either going to reject and defy our Lord or you're going to repent and depend on Him to be your life. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word in this place today. Pray with me. Lord, I want to pray that you would empower me to not be a flincher, but a fighter. And Lord, from time to time, when we hit some tough subjects, um, that are on the front line. Would you empower us through your word? I love how your word is so powerful and effective for helping every one of us fight. And I pray, Lord, that we are trusting and that we're believing and we're resting not in the ever-changing thoughts of our culture, but in the everlasting truths of your word. Lord, empower us. And today, Lord, I would love for us to end our time together being so thankful, so grateful that Jesus is our way maker. That he provided a way for us to be redeemed. In the name of Jesus, we pray.